Uh, my name is Michael Catalina. I'm one of the PGY6s here. And so I just wanted to start off by introducing um, uh, Dr. Shagru in, in a little bit of an unconventional way by sort of doing a lead up to his presentation. I know him, um, you know, over the last couple weeks and months, I've been able to get to experience a little bit of uh, what he's uh, teaching um, and some of his expertise. And, and, and over the last couple of years, I've spent learning a lot about um, connectomics and, uh, you know, how to apply it to our patients. So I want to start off with this quote by Harvey Cushing. It says, a physician is obligated to consider more than a diseased organ, more than even the whole man. He must view the man in his world. And there's a lot of ways you might interpret this quote, one of which is directly applicable to the way that we operate on our patients. And, and that, you know, if we're operating on a patient, it, that, that patient is not just a, a brain tumor, right? That doesn't define that patient. That patient may be defined by the fact that, that he or she is a physician or a carpenter or something else um, that is related to uh, that person's life. And so I think it's important for us to consider these things and how we and how our operations affect people. And this is a complicated process, but it definitely uh, it's hard for us to understand sometimes how we can improve this process and how we can improve our operations. But I think what Dr. Shagru is going to talk about is something that's really important. Um, and then I want to go to another quote that's, uh, by Wilder Penfield. So. This is after uh, some work that he did on stimulation of the cortex um, in the early 1900s and mid 1900s. And this is what one of the major conclusions that he had. He said, it is clear that the most important means of coordinating the function of the cortical areas is not the association mechanisms within the cortex. And even at this stage of our understanding, it was clear that in order to coordinate complex human function, there was more, the, the, the organ or the mechanism was more than just purely a cortical, uh, of cortical origin. And so what we're talking about um, really is, 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 is more than just simple neuroanatomy or simple understanding of, 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 of brain function, but it's actually a complicated process that involves the cognitive evolution of the brain's understanding of itself. It's our, the depth of our experience as human beings and our ability to interpret that experience as, as scientists and as neurosurgeons and apply that to the care of our patients. And so things like this just absolutely blow my mind. And this, this is a attention-based theory of brain morphogenesis by David Van Essen that was published in Nature um, you know, over 20 years ago. And it talks about basically what this figure shows is that the, 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 the morphogenesis or the morphology of the human brain is, is really dependent on tension from within the brain, it's the, the white matter itself and the connections to maximize the distribution of the, the cortical surface and to decrease the cost or the energy expenditure and increase the complexity of the arrangement. So this, uh, something like this is like absolutely mind blowing. And it really makes you question the significance of just a uh, single gyri function uh, for the human brain. And so I wanna start off by introducing doc Dr. Shagru and say that, you know, he's, he's a neurosurgeon from the Prince of Wales. He's, he trained at UCSF. He's uh, highly, he's published over 200 um, academic uh, manuscripts. Um, he's a prolific uh, educator, um, and what one of the things that I, I, I valued most about our relationship over the last couple months is the fact that he has a genuine interest in teaching these very complicated um, kind of concepts um, to people like me and to to residents uh, and to, to surgeons and physicians and not just neurosurgeons, but um, other physicians, and uh, I think that you know the the value of this information um, is more than just within our specialty, but it spans um, all of our understanding of of who we are as human beings and and how we can apply that um, as neurosurgeons to our work. And so, thank you, Dr. Shagru, for uh, taking the time to speak to us.
Um, he's coming to us from Australia when it's, um, it's uh, later in the evening for him, but thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Well, thanks for having me speak, guys. Um, let me get my screen up here. Well, what I'm going to talk to you guys about is about connectomics. And that's not the first slide. That's the first slide. And what we're going to talk about is how do we change the oncofunctional balance? But that's not really what we're here to specifically talk about. I'm focusing on gliomas because that's what I really made my emphasis on um, and so about taking them out. But in the process of studying connectomics for changing the oncofunctional balance, uh, in particular uh, glioma surgery, we it really became obvious that in order to change the oncofunctional balance in a meaningful way, you have to utilize techniques like connectomics because we really have a poor understanding of especially how the higher brain works. So what does the term connectomics even mean? And it's new to most people. But in short, it's an omics, which means it's big data, just like genomics. It's genomics, it's basically an omics for the connections of the brain. And for the, all intents and purposes, for the clinical applications, it really means processing different types of fMRI series to show the connectivity, both structural and functional in the brain, to make it make sense. So I, really to summarize, if I, if I wanted to get, a, if you're only gonna take one slide out of this whole talk, it's this. So we're really good at making the slide on the left look at the slide, look like the slide on the right. Now, again, not everyone's equally good at this, but there's a lot of people who could take a tumor like this and do a reasonable job of oncologically reducing it, okay? I'm, I'm really good at putting holes in people's brains where there used to be tumors. One of the challenges with it is that there's a great mystery of why some patients like this do fantastic and other patients who get the same onco, you know, anatomical result don't do as well. And, what, and I think we need to be honest with ourselves that there's a tendency for everyone who does neurosurgery, we know it's a difficult job, and we know that, that all of us have a tendency to want to have a defense mechanism where we say, well, my patients do fine, you know, they're not all bad. And most of them don't. If you're a good surgeon, you know, you're not oftentimes having patients like this who are neurologically devastated if you're, you know, using the techniques that we know of until you really talk to them. And what you find out is that a lot of these patients move all four, they talk, they look okay, but then they never go back to work or their family tell, will tell you that their personality is completely changed or they can never really multitask anymore. And while you might at some point say, well, you know, remember it's an oncofunctional balance. So the more of the tumor you take out, the more likely you are to encounter parts of the tumor where there is brain lines in it. But of course, we know that we're dealing with cancer. You know, as Duke Sampson said, we're not treating colds here, guys. We're neurosurgeons. And so you might just say, well, maybe I don't want to, you know, leave two, you know, 5% of the tumor to save some esoteric brain function. They'll just have to learn to live with it because it's a fatal disease and resection matters. That's a fair point. What I'm going to argue is that what we need to be doing is having a better understanding of what those trade-offs are. Because while it's totally acceptable to make a, a calculated decision to ignore brain uh, brain function in the suit of uh, better, better tumor reception, better epilepsy control, whatever it is. We all know that what we don't want to do is have it happen and we didn't expect it, or not even, and even worse, if we didn't have any idea how what we did wrong and we can't learn from it. And so connectomics is about putting the functional boundaries and looking at the brain the way it really is and helping us have a better understanding of what we should and should not be doing in the operating room. And one of the things that really, um, if you follow the history of neuroscience, and, and again, Michael started with this uh, talk about, about Wilder Penfield, at one point neurosurgeons were at the forefront of driving neuroscientific insight. And some of the most important and durable neuroscientific insights come out of operative, uh, either operative stimulation or operative fiascos, if you will. Uh, for example, we all know what the hippocampus is because of epilepsy surgery, but that those worlds have started to separate and, and it's been to our detriment that we haven't kept up on some of the innovations, particularly over the last 15 years with uh, uh, neuroscience, particularly connectomics. So I'm going to start off by first kind of giving people some insights of what we learned about the brain from the connectome. I'll talk a little bit about how to apply it um, and particularly on how do we first improve our oncological resections by being able to push the boundaries up to a point where we really know, not that we're just scared that there's something over there, but we really know that there's a network or something important in there. 
And the second is how can we actually keep pushing that further by reorganizing the connectome uh, strategically? So one of the things that has come out of neuroscience over the last uh, 15 years is that most higher brain functions, I mean, cognitive functions, are the result of large scale brain networks. And these are areas that are not in continuity with each other that fire together on a similar time course. And oftentimes they serve a common function. So for example, language is a brain network, depending on how you define a brain network. Um, and there's a sensory motor brain network, a visual network, for example. But not all the networks have a clean function. Some of them are doing much more complicated functions that don't lend ourselves itself to vocabulary. You know, when we have a metacognitive view of our brain, it's hard to you know really have a best way to describe like how do we um, you know think about our own cognition, metacognition. It doesn't fit itself into into clinical terms very well. So. The first question that I think is worth answering is, if there are brain networks and they're important, how many are there and what are there? And the answer is that's a question that can go, be an entire talk by itself. But I'm gonna give you the simplified version of, and say that there are about seven. Now, each one of these networks can be subdivided into other networks and they can these in turn can be subdivided into other networks. And some parts of the brain don't only lightly fit with their brain network and other parts are central to the core. And so this is a helpful diagram from a paper by Randy Buckner at Harvard. And what he what they were doing was they said, OK, take every part of the brain and show me who it fires with. But you can only cluster these into seven clusters. And so what the machine learning spits out is very consistent. Other people have repeated this. You have a sensory motor network that looks so like this. Note that the auditory cortex and portions of the insula are included in that. Uh, the visual network, basically where we would expect the limbic system, which again, notably includes uh, portions of the orbital frontal cortex and anterior temporal pole. The uh, central executive network is this orange network, it's kind of all over the brain. Uh, the de default mode network, which again was discovered in 2001, but we now know is probably one of the most important cognitive networks in the brain. The salience network was discovered even later, I think it's 2008 if I remember correctly. Um, and, and again, it's the pink network. And then a final network called the dorsal attention network, which is in green. Now, again, um, we can get even further more granular. And so this was a paper in Nature in uh, 2016, where uh, the Human Connectome Project decided to say, how many unique areas of the cortex are there? And they concluded that there was about 180 per hemisphere. There's other estimates, but if you look at it, they're all kind of hovering around that number at the end of the day. Um, we like this one because they made an effort to be consensus. So they looked at all the other papers that have been published. And so, for example, Brodman's areas stayed to the extent that they were valid. But I think one of the things you really have to look at, if you take a real thoughtful look at this diagram, is that there are functional areas that cross sulci. There's functional areas on the undersurface of the operculum that are different than the outer surface. And many of these things really don't, the brain really does not care what we call a gyrus. The gyrus has nothing to do with the, the level of function, or the functional organization of the cortex. And so we really have to start thinking about the brain a little bit differently and, and really start to use more granular techniques. Because again, if you just say, save the SDG, the SDG is multiple areas that do different things in different parts of it. So one of the things we started doing, and we published an entire issue of uh, operative neurosurgery, about 18 papers. And what we were doing was trying to take this system and describe it as much as we possibly could. Because what we thought was this is a good alphabet so that we, you know, we're surgeons, it's good to have nomenclature. So it's good to say if we're talking about 8C, we're talking about the same area. And so then what we did was we went through and took everything in, in the fMRI literature and mapped it to those points. So for example, this is a map of every paper that's ever cited a language task. And you can see this in you know, red, green, and blue, those are the overlaps of those tasks. We can then take those and map them to, those, to that scheme because we knew where those places were in space. And we can make a map and say, this is the best estimate we have of the language system. Now notice, this is a lot more complicated than broken Wernicke's, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But it shows that connectomics can, can significantly improve our specificity of anatomy and our ability to describe anatomy in the cerebral cortex in ways that actually have pretty clear uh, uh, ramifications, particularly as we begin to know the function of some of these areas. So I'll kind of talk about um, two interesting ones that have come out of our work. One is the, the concept of control networks. 
Now, we didn't discover these. We're not the, the world's experts on these. What we did was try to link the anatomy to them. But essentially, the control networks sit at the top of the cognitive hierarchy. So these networks kind of determine what other networks are doing. And the big two are the central executive network and the default mode network. This diagram kind of describes how they're different. The CEN is an external goal-driven network. The DMN is the internal mental network. And a third network called the stainless network modulates how they switch on and off. So when you're thinking to yourself, DMN, CEN is when you're not when you're thinking externally. So when we look at the singulum bundle, if you've studied data on tractography, this is kind of what it looks like. And we've seen those little fibers coming out the back, but we really underestimated what it's really doing because we think about it as the Papez circuit, but it's a lot more than that. And this is what, what our map of that looks like of what actually is going through the singulum. It's, I, I don't expect everyone to grasp all the details here, but what I'll say in short is that that area there is the posterior cingulate cortex. And as you can see, it's the most heavily connected part of the human neocortex. There's really, believe it or not, is one of the champions. And the reason it's doing that is it's the hub of the default mode network, particularly that posterior DMN is part of the, it's really where your, we had to say where your internal mental thoughts are happening, that's kind of where it is. And so it explains why people with certain, particularly biparietal things such as butterfly gliomas, have such problems with organizing thoughts and cognition is that you know it's attacking the core of that network. But notice that it also has an anterior cingulate and a, and a lateral parietal portion. The salience network intertwines with it as a cingulate opercular network. It's a medial cingulate and or a middle cingulate and anterior insula. It's linked by a, the track called the frontal acetylene track. And the central executive network is a, um, at its core, and these are the cores of the networks, not the entire network, but um, is, has an anterior frontal pole, which again, we know the frontal pole is part of uh, organized thought, but not the entire frontal pole, different parts of the frontal pole do different things. Um, but it also has an area called 8C, which is a, a really critical hub of the brain and uh, uh, some parts of the parietal lobe in the supramarginal gyrus. So when we run through what these networks are doing, you'll start to see that this covers a large band of the cognitive uh, landscape. Um, for example, the, the uh, default mode network is involved in internal thought, imagination. Almost every mental illness we know of has some kind of problem with how the DMN talks to itself or how it talks to other networks. Um, and again, if you look this up, there are about 10,000 published papers on this network now. Um, again, uh, I've been kicking it, dragging into the neurosurgical consciousness for a few years now. And I really became interested in it when I first started looking about why butterfly gliomas are very difficult operations to have you know, good success with. Um, now with the, the salience network, which is that middle singular opercular network, it's really part of coordinating responses to pain and emotional regulation. Um, so for example, salience network problems have been linked to diseases like fibromyalgia, it may be part of the driving force of that disease, why these patients are so sensitive to non-noxious or non-harmful stimuli. And uh, the central executive network does things like executive function and working memory. Finally, the dorsal tension network, which I briefly talked about, really should be thought of as an IQ network. It's part of direct, uh, uh, directed attention. And, and again, by itself, could be its own talk. So running through that again, you can see that I showed the cores of these networks, but there's a lot more to it. Um, again, sensory motor, vision, limbic, the ones you guys probably know already. The CN in orange in multiple places, the DMN in red salience in, in pink, and the dorsal tension network in green. Where this really becomes interesting is when you look at this and say, man, that's just a, you know, a lot to learn and all this stuff. There's actually a complete logic to it, and it's very beautiful. But one of the things that um, we start talking about is that there are practical implications to it. And what the practical implications are, um, and for example, why is the medial frontal syndrome which is an akinesis syndrome, what are we actually injuring? Where in the frontal lobe? Because we know that we, you, know, you can do some things to the frontal lobe, but we also know that if you put a retractor here, you cause an ACA stroke, you get some pretty you know, out of it patients. Where are we damaging exactly? Um, and be, this doesn't become an issue every day, but it, you know, these kind of little neat, uh, you know, details really do matter, particularly when you're doing brain surgery and we don't have a, a clear and home picture. Um, and this is the model that we've come up with. Um, so essentially the DMN is here in green, the salience network is part of shutting it off. You can see they intertwine by fi fibers that are connecting them. And the salience network is actually part of the SMA. Um, so the SMA, it, it shares a node with it and 
is obviously we know SMA syndrome is an initiation problem. So ultimately, um, when you look at this as a combined thing, this is part of uh, the concept of free will or the ability to the desire to activate. And we're not the only people to call it this. This group from Harvard actually did stroke studies and showed that this is the common site of lesion. If you can see on the lower right, um, that the salience, that salience DMN region is the common site of lesion to people who have akinetic mutism. Now, the question is, again, and this is a clinical question, uh, is DMN salience injury bilaterally necessary or is it unilateral? It's in, is it, there's a tumor or reorganization? There's a lot of questions you can ask, but the bottom line is, that when we talk about bifrontal injury, it is probably mainly best thought of as bisingulate injury. And that, if you can see the anatomy here, that this gives a good justification for it. Another thing, we need, and really my, the first thing that got me interested in tectomics was despite training with Mitch Berger and having a lot of background in wake speech mapping, I found out that the language system was a lot more complicated than I thought. And I didn't know, what, there were patients that I operated on that had language problems that weren't catastrophic. But, but I didn't understand exactly what I did wrong. And simple, when we look at this model, the name's Broken Work here, two guys who've been dead for, since over 150 years ago, and we haven't updated their model very much. Well, they've done a lot, they did a lot right, but they didn't, it's, it's, it's really, you know, uh, pretty naive to think that these guys nailed it the first time 150 years ago and there's nothing to update and we don't need to learn anything else about how brain, the brain processes speech because it's just a simple little arrow diagram. One of the things that started really um, attacking at that foundation is work by a lot of people, including Pete Foe, a guy named Marcel Messalam, and um, uh, people at, in Italy working under Marco Catani and some stuff that we've worked with, showing that, that at least there's a second pathway of language and it's centered around the temporal pole, which in, is involved in um, either, depends on how you describe it, verbal memory, semantic processing, what, what have you. Um, and it really comes down to how does the information come from this model here? And again, this is what I would say is a more modern model of how speech is processed. How does it come from this temporal um, area, which we would call Wernicke's area? Again, it's important to know that if you look at that, if you look up Wernicke's area on Google, it can be anything from the angular gyro, parts of the, sorry, the supermarginal gyrus to the entire parietal lobe. Um, so it's it's it, part of this was that we weren't people weren't being very specific of what Wernicke's area even was, but when we look at this, we note that there are other interesting areas. One of them that I put an arrow to is this area 55B, a small area in the medial frontal lobe, and it's uh, probably a motor cortex of the larynx. So it and again, when we start looking at the fact that there are other language production sites in the in the, the SMA and other areas that, as you see in this diagram, you probably never heard of. It really shows that why in some cases we have language disturbances, even despite doing speech mapping, that often improve sometimes, but they're not totally normal if you really talk to the patient and the family. And this is a case where that happened to me. So this was a case I did uh, about eight years ago now. And this is before we even knew what 55B was, because this CAC Home project hadn't discovered this place and no one knew about it. And so, um, as you can see, this is a pretty localized glioma, nothing too ferocious. I wouldn't call this a traditional speech mapping case. So I, I, did, I think I even did this awake, but to be honest, I didn't find a whole lot. And the reason I didn't find a whole lot is 55B sits in a sulcus, um, but so, and stimuli down in the sulcus, because that's not usually what we do. But um, this guy was left with a complete ability to type an email that we can advise people about financial dealings, he handles all of his AD, ADLs, but he cannot phone it, he can't speak. Um, and when we had a, a professional linguist come out from California and spend five hours with him, uh, the conclusion was pretty clear, and we published this in neurosurgery, that the only thing wrong with him is his larynx. So the, the bottom line is that uh, we didn't know about this, and we didn't know about this eight years ago, and the connectome taught us later on what we did wrong. And is going to and over time will help us continue to reduce the morbidity we have where we don't have the explanations. So when we start looking at the components of language, it has areas such as um, the the map that I showed you, which are part of speech. But understand, there's also a whole cognitive side of language that involves parts of the default mode network. If you look here, the temporal pole um, and areas including the ILF and IFOF, which uh, perform cognitive tasks within the language system. And when we take this together, you can see that the language system becomes significantly more complicated. 
So this is actually the diagram that we published in a review paper in JNS uh, two months ago now. And what we're really showing is that this is a, a proposed model of all the things that we've learned from connectomics that supplement how language is processed in the human brain. So I mentioned earlier, and I just like showing this, and I'll try to go through this quickly in the interest of time, but again, the networks, we have sensory motor, vision, limbic, CEN, DMN, salience, and dorsal attention. Now, the issue is they may seem incomprehensibly complicated, but it turns out that they're not. So if you look in the midline, this didn't happen on accident. This is a repetitive subunit and patterning that we see in the nervous system. And further, when we look at the dorsal or the default mode network, and, and true, certainly with every network, that it makes sort of S-shaped, where it goes from posterior cingulate, anterior cingulate, comes onto the hemisphere, and loops back like this. But it turns out the CEN does that. Salience network does that. And even to a lesser extent, the dorsal uh, attention network does. And it's been turned out that this phylogeny of adding subunits on scales at least to the bottom of uh, primate uh, neuro, neuro uh, evolution. So as you start to look into this, you think, okay, well, that, that seems interesting. This seems to have added you know, repetitive subunits in continuous places. And what, what you can see is that this is actually even replicated in the cerebellum. So when you look at the networks in the cerebellum, Notice that and this is a, a kind of a mid parasagittal cut. In blue, you have motor, and then you have in the pink, you have salience, CN, DMN, and then they reflect back on each other and do the same thing in the, in the opposite order. And even there's even segregation of these networks and in, in, in actually pretty logical segregation. So, for example, the caudate is mostly DMN, for example. And we, you start seeing the sensory motor in the putamen, and we know that's kind of the organization of the basal ganglia, in the basal ganglia, which argues that these control networks, the higher level four networks, are the main organizing principle of, of the hu human cerebrum. And the subunit in it can't, really can't be ignored. So I think that I always like sharing that because I think it's really uh, a fascinating look on the brain. So, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about science. How do we actually use this? And, um, Again, I spent time writing a book about how to actually use this. People have found that this is helpful. And one of the reasons I decided to write a book was I thought I was taught pretty well how to take out brain tumors, and it was. But I think that there's some things that I was taught that were wrong. And one of the things I was taught was there was this concept called eloquence and non-eloquence. Your goal is to be in the non-eloquent brain. And then if you're really in the non-eloquent brain like the frontal pole, I mean, you could go hog wild. It didn't matter what you did there. Um, just stay in the tumor, don't cut the corticospinal tract, patients will be fine. Well, it depends where your, where your standards are. If you want to have a patient who moves all four, these are pretty good pieces of advice. Um, if you want to have patients who go on and live as normal a life as possible given their circumstances, I think we can do a lot better than this. And the reality is, anyone who's being honest, if you really spend time talking to your patients, you will know that there are deficits we do not have an explanation for and our patients Talk to their families, I promise you, they, are, they, they will tell you a lot of things that you're not doing as well as you think you are. And that's true for all of us. Now, this doesn't mean we're all bad surgeons. It means that we have an inadequate understanding of the brain and we're not, we don't have the tools right now to avoid these kinds of things. So we step into traps that probably 50 years from now, everyone's gonna look and say, well, I can't believe we used to do that. Just like when people talk about operating without microscopes or all the other things from the days of the giants. And so, Remember that whether you admit it or not, when you cut the brain, you're cutting next to one of these brain networks. And the, the anatomy, the subcortical space, has anatomy. There's stuff running through it. It may seem like it's amorphous, but it's not amorphous. It knows its own structure. You're the problem, not, not the brain. And I think that the concept that there's this non eloquent part of the brain that is irrelevant is a really oversimplification of what we talk about when we mean redundancy. The brain did not evolve the frontal pole to be a CSF absorber. It's all doing something. And so that doesn't mean that we can't cut into the brain. Of course we can, we know we can. The question is, what can we do and what we can't do? And what are the consequences for what we do? And, and that means that everything is doing something, but some things can be compensated for. And so what I look at when I think about adjuncts like imaging, like ETI is, and I describe it like this. 
um, in terms of the nation of Venice, which was an independent nation from uh, Middle Ages till I believe 1811 when Napoleon finished it off. It wasn't independent because people didn't try to take it over. They tried many times, but what they found was that when they came from the mainland, um, the Venetian lagoon which, uh, was so difficult and treacherous to navigate that they often the boats wrecked and the battle was over before it started. And the Venetians kept the path uh, secret on pain of death. Nowadays, there are posts to tell you what not to do. And so lagoon is the, is the cerebral white matter and a lot of the brain. We don't have anatomy there. We don't have anatomy in the subcortex. And there are lots of ways you can wreck your boat and not even know what you did wrong after you wrecked it. The posts are things like BTI and fMRI and other connectomic adjuncts that can put annotations. Now, that doesn't keep you from wrecking your boat, but it makes it less likely. So what we're really trying to do with these kind of operations is to separate what is needed to function from what is going to, um, what's going to go. And that line, it, again, is defining the oncofunctional balance, which is, it's always better to get more tumor, but there, you know, to, it's hard to argue that improving the extent of resection from 98% to 99% and leaving a patient globally aphasic is a good trade-off for that patient. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how to navigate that to the best of our ability. And more knowledge, of course, helps us make better decisions that nobody's a smarter doctor with less information. So when we talk about DTI and fMRI, the question is, why aren't we doing this on all of our patients? And it really comes down, it's not that this isn't, you know, research technology that no one knows what to do with. Um, there's 550,000 papers. This is not new been around since I was in, uh, in fifth grade. So it, the issue with it is, the reason we're not getting this all the time is that we oftentimes have, it's very difficult to get, requires PhDs to go set things up and run pipelines and it takes forever. And, and so of course that means that only on the epilepsy case of somebody who has four weeks to get ready for this, are we getting this? And as because we don't have this all the time, we don't become familiar with it. And if we're not familiar with it, then we don't know what to do with the information. And then of course it becomes a vicious cycle. And part of this is that we've looked at this and said that DTI is all we needed. And, and the reason is it looks good. I mean, we have these pictures are great you know, screenshots, but ultimately it's without having something like artificial intelligence and other techniques to try to sort through these fibers and tell you what's important and what's not, it's too much information. You can't sit there and obviously you're gonna have to cut something. And so what you want to know is which one of these fibers do you not cut and which one are you going to decide to cut. And again, a lot of this comes from going from a step like this. This is actually an fMRI, but regardless of which, it's an extremely high dimensional data set. And if you look at this, at every single point in here, there is a bold signal, there's a uh, activity signal that's happening. And that's a lot of information and human beings are not a, really good at handling nine million dimensional data sets but computers are and they've made a lot of progress particularly in doing this in the last 10 years now coming back to the term of parcellation parcellation again is a term that everyone has has is familiar with at least one of them which is broad means parcellation which so has been done for a long time and it just means to divide the cortex up into um, individual subunits based on some kind of measure, we use cyto architecture. But it's a critical step for dimensionality reduction, meaning to cut the data down to a size where we can actually understand it. Now, this is actually my brain, and this is the HCP parcellation, but again, there's lots of different strategies to it. We like the HCP in part because we know a lot about it, and we know where, what, who's part of what network in it. And so, again, as I pointed out, we wrote a few papers on it, and one of the things that people came back and said, well, Mike, this is an amazing amount of work, but how do you actually use this? And that's a fair point. And it's no, I don't expect everyone to read 18 papers and 500 pages and memorize everything, because to be honest, I've spent a lot more time out there than most people, and I don't know everything that's in there, because it's just, it's a massive amount of information. But in order to really apply this, you have to be able to get your patient to, um, have these an atlas like this where the regions or parcellations are actually mapped and where it's worked onto their brain or assigned in some way and the typical way is you take the atlas and you shift it and, and squeeze it so it fits onto uh, the brain that you're looking at now this doesn't do a perfect job you can see on the left side there's a couple areas where soul sign missing but it does okay until you put the kind of people we see in here on this 
And so as a, as a result, neurosurgery really hasn't taken advantage of some of the connectomic tools that are out there and some of the, the serious revolution of technology that people have been using to make sense of things like mental illness. And so what, what we did is we decided to come up with a machine learning approach to this. And we call it reparcelation. And I'll just show you the video real quick. Um, so what we did is we trained um, a machine learning tool to recognize what a voxel of every parcelation of the brain look like. So in this case, we're trying to map area 44. So we taught it how to know whether or not you're part of 44 based on who you're connected to on DTI. We don't use DTI, but just you get the gist. So we would know that that voxel is connected to a part of Wernicke's area, so you're cool. But this guy over here, he's not. And one of the advantages of this technique is that first thing is patient specific. So it basically can warp this onto anyone's brain um, and it's not gonna stick things in the sylvian fissure, for example, because of my connections. But where it really shines is when it attempts to do a brain tumor. So if it see, sees that there's the original assignment of that parcellation is in a brain tumor, it knows that, oh, well, there's no connections there. That's just necrosis in the GBM. And this is the other connection, the right connection. So, this is the, um, the worst case I could possibly find. So this is had a patient had a frontal lobectomy as a recurrent glioblastoma with butterfly to the other side. The insula, as you can see on the right, is shifted into the cavity. Despite that, it still knows where the basal ganglia is. And it also knows when areas are missing um, and also knows how to deal with shift and things like this because, it, you know, again, if the, if the, if the brain, the parcellation shifts, the connection is shift too. So what it allows us to do is to look at a case that we know is bad and surgically treacherous and you know, something like this. And instead of just us going into this blindly or saying, oh, well, then we can never ever help this person. The answer is somewhere in between where we can actually start to understand the risk of this, understand what we can do, what we can't do and why this is a bad term. So for example, you can see here, here's a mapping of the sensory motor network with the AI and also the language system. You can see it's on the boundaries of this tumor. But more importantly, that this tumor is wrapped around the default mode network. Now, we, never, we wouldn't have been able to see this five years ago or even two years ago. But now we can see that this, exactly why this is a bad tumor, because taking this out, you're highly likely to damage parts of that network. Now, the question is, we don't have the technology now to tell whether it's damaged already. Um, but uh, again, it starts to give you a clear understanding of what you're dealing with here. And also, again, as we start to look at even tackling very complex cases like this, is it possible for us to really start to think about this as a series of safe cuts? Um, so again, this is from the book I wrote. Um, and what we're trying to do is think about cuts that were safe to do that would accomplish um, a surgery of some kind. So if you're doing a posterior temporal lobectomy. And when we had this, we started thinking about how do we make a tool out of this that simplifies this? So someone doesn't have to memorize this diagram or no parcellations or things. And what we made was a tool that would basically, all you needed to know was what part of the brain you're in, and it would make the montage out of it. Um, so that tool is actually uh, currently going through the FDA, and hopefully we'll be on the market relatively soon. So when, when you start looking at a bad case like this, that isn't quite as bad as a posterior spinal butterfly glioma, we start looking at it as a series of disconnections, where we, instead of just saying, let's go in here into the center of this of the CUSA and just suck away at this and hope we don't hurt anything, we can instead look at this and say, oh, well, we're actually cutting with the sensory motor system, we're cutting with the default mode network, and we're cutting with the central executive network. Now, again, in this case, we left tumor in the basal ganglia because it can seem like a good trade-off. Um, and again, there's going to be cognitive consequences for this in all likelihood, but what we start to say is let's minimize the cognitive footprint where we cause less inadvertent damage as we can. But when we start looking at really higher cognition, often this requires something more complicated. And so you can utilize a technique called graph theory, where you look at every part of the brain and, and you look at it in, in a, as almost like a series of telephone wires in an electrical grid. And how you do this is you can take the DTI, parcelate it, and then you look at every part of the brain and how much it connects to every other part of the brain. And you can measure um, what are called hubness. And hubness is, how connected are you to other areas of the brain? So the, the lowest form of, the best form of hubness is this one on the right called page range centrality. Um, and it just says that you're connected to a lot of really important people. So when we looked at, at who were the biggest hubs in the brain, 
And it turns out that is the Spetzer Martin eloquence that gets you the point for eloquence. And these are some other areas that are pretty important as well that are on the Spetzer Martin scale. So, what eloquence really means is hub. These are the hubs of the brain. Um, and we know that taking down hubs is bad. We've also found that in some people, and I don't have time to go into this paper in extreme detail, but it was published relatively recently in the Journal of Oncology. There are a percentage of people who have hubs in the brain where you don't expect them. And I hypothesize, and I don't have hard evidence for this yet, but um, that these may be the people who we do a, a very simple operation and they're much more uh, web poured off than, than we expect. Finally, well, I'll talk about individual neuro rehabilitation. Again, this is about moving the functional functional balance with brain stimulation. Brain stimulation, like TMS, is an FDA approved treatment. It's extremely safe. Um, we, it has an incredibly small risk of a seizure, otherwise it, it really doesn't make patients worse. And one of the questions is, particularly in post-surgical patients, where do you aim the device? And so what we started doing is, and I'll zoom ahead here, is utilizing things like resting state fMRI to say what areas are not talking to each other correctly. So in this big diagram, what you're looking at is this is every area of the brain on the X and Y axes listed out, and every dot is a comparison between those two areas. So red areas, for example, are talking to each other a lot, blue areas are not talking to each other a lot. And what's nice about this is because of all the research we've done, we know who's who in this zoo, so that we can actually look at an area like the language system. And so what you can see here, this is the language system in a normal person. This is a patient with a tumor in the articulus with aphasia. That looks really cool that, that in, you're seeing blue instead of red because blue is not talking to itself. But more importantly, that's a part of the brain. That's actually that area 55B. So we can actually pull that out as an object and stimulate it to try to change how it's behaving. And we've been doing this in Sydney for um, the past two years now. We've treated close to 100 patients, I think, and developed more sophisticated AI tools to target this and to really look at whole scale connectomes. And what I can say um, is that there are different disease states that have um, different rates of success, but our favorite patients are our brain tumor patients because the recoveries are often very dramatic. So what that means, of course, is that if we can sit down and look at somebody's connectome with artificial intelligence, know what's not normal or what's normal, look at their structural connectome, say what was removed, we can have cases like this where we have a patient who wakes up with some significant aphasia for an operation, and we can stimulate where that arrow is, and you can see that not only does the area uh, begin to work better, but you actually uh, begin to spread collateral connections. Um, and this is in the setting of regaining a substantial component of the SMA syndrome and, um, that had been present for this patient uh, for over a year. Uh, so we did not do the initial operation, but we did therapy. And um, it kind of speaks for itself, I think. Now, what that means is then, of course, if we can A, do better surgeries and B, rehab our patients more aggressively, instead of just sending them to a speech therapist and for the best, we actually take over, guide it with the connectome and stimulation that really shifts the oncological functional balance to where we have the potential to really get better results for patients. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shagru. Um, that was really uh, remarkable. I, I think the, every time I hear you talk, it's, I, it's, I learn more and more and more. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna open it up now. We have, about 10 minutes um, for discussion. And so I want to open the floor. I, I see we have a number of folks from uh, neuroradiology, um, neurology, and radiation oncology who we've uh, invited to, to be here. So thank you all for, for, for uh, joining us. Um, so I wanted to open up the floor to questions if anyone has any. So my biggest question, this is Valerie Jules, one of the neuroradiologists. How did you get the PhDs to work with you on these projects and where did you get the money to do this? Because this is very, very time intensive and we need to bring the silos together of the PhDs and the physicians, which there are no PhDs that do this work on this talk right now. 
but that's the crux of the problem at UNC and probably <laughs> most places. Yes, so so it was an even worse problem at Oklahoma where I, where I was before coming to Sydney. And what I found was that the software is all this open source stuff that works great if you're a coder, but otherwise, so I originally taught myself to code and I was doing all this myself, which is an enormous sense because I had no help. Ultimately, when I got to Sydney, I met with some people who were artificial intelligence people. We started a company we, um, and realized that this is an industry problem. If you're talking about making good software, it's not done by you know, academia, it's done by software companies. And the kind of people who, you know, who make algorithms can be anywhere. But when you're talking about taking an algorithm, making it run well and fast and all this sort of stuff, that is clearly an industry thing. And the type of people know how to do that are in software industry. So we started a software company. Um, and so now in order to get the, the, the core imaging, essentially it can be pushed directly from the cloud after being integrated with a PAX gap server. And all the processing is done automatically. Um, it takes about an hour to get a full HTTP pipeline. Now, some of it is, some of them are, some of the pipelines that we have are purpose specifically for surgical planning. Um, and that product we're taking to the FDA, for example, is that. But some of it is, some of it's designed for mass scale research. Um, and again, I didn't go into, you know, uh, explaining everything we're doing. But the bottom line is that, you know, we have to look at it and say, what are things that academia is good at? What are things that industry is good at? And how do we get group, these groups to work together to really accelerate the discovery of how the brain works before, you know, I'd like to know how more about how it works before I retire. And the pace that we're at, it, it wasn't going to happen. So your program or process is for purchase or how does this work? Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, we can spend some time talking about it, um, but essentially it's a, it's a subscription. So we work through a SaaS model. The software runs in Chrome, Google Chrome. So there's no download, though so it, it has a, it does have an API integration to the, as a, as a gap server into the uh, IT infrastructure. Um, but that's, again, this is a longer discussion, but yeah, it, uh, it does have a, we, we have a couple different programs that we can discuss with if you guys are interested. Hey, Dr. Shiguri, this is uh, Kevin Kramer. I'm a physiatrist at UNC um, and a Department of Neurosurgery, and I found your talk fascinating. Um, Dr. Catalina has talked to me about this in the past and, uh, you know, have, have, have some idea of, of definitely what you, you guys are doing. Um, my question to you is in terms of a research, um, have you guys looked at this uh, studying brain injury and uh, concussion specifically? And, um, and if not, we have a center here and we have lots of clinical data and would love to collaborate with you. Yeah, sure. So um, we have a cloud that's capable of processing up to 10,000 scans in an hour. Um, so it's more than anyone has um, and can run uh, dozens and dozens of machine learning solutions to try to find the best fit. So the real limit now is just find, having patients and signing them up. But this is something we're obviously very interested in. The question is, of course, you know, um, what's the correct resolution and what are you looking for and what are the measurements but ultimately it all comes down to this everything in med clinical medicine epidemiology is uh you have an a which is something in the connectome and you're trying to predict b which is something that we care about and machine learning is just a method for figuring out how to fit a to b um, so what we have to have is a question of what do you want to try to solve about concussions and the data and we can turn it into a big time machine learning model and a few you know few days usually. Awesome, thank you. We have a couple questions from the from the audience in the chat. Thank you. I forgot to mention um, that we you can also put questions in the chat. Um, we have a, a question from one of our uh, neurovascular attendings. Um, and uh, the question is um, because uh, it said you had mentioned Dr. Sugru that <laughs> the the hubs uh, were the ones that might potentially have more deficits after surgery if they're injured. Um, but since they have more con uh, connections, do you think that there's any benefit to targeting these hubs for, uh, for TMS post-surgery? Um, or have you found uh, you know, that only certain patients do better with that compared to others? Um, to be honest, we started doing this two years ago. And in part because it, it, when you take the, when I took the course at Duke about TMS, they listed neurosurgery as a contraindication. 
And so I raise my hand and go, do you guys think that I'm crazy that I'm trying it? And they go, oh, no, no, everyone's just been afraid to do it. But if you guys aren't afraid, you guys think you can handle seizures. Turns out that it doesn't matter. Even if people aren't into epileptics, we've still never had seizures. So we, we've we started treating everybody. We don't worry about that. Um, we just warn the patient that we've never had one, but we could happen. It's about eight and 110,000 now, I think is the current estimate. As far as it goes, as a result, we don't have the kind of level of granularity of what's the best target. It is a wide, wide open field of what how to, what areas you go after and what's the strategy. Um, because, you know, two years ago, we couldn't have that kind of granularity of, you know, and we just put a paper out um, that's hopefully going to get in um, to a good journal soon. We've been fighting for years about it. But essentially, we found that um, the machine learning kept pointing us to one area, 8AV, for patients with anxiety, and it gets rid of the anxiety every time we treat it. Sometimes you get that kind of, this is the one size fits all, but in many cases, in particular the surgical patients, they're all going to have different structural connectomes, different functional connectomes. So hubs seem like a good idea. Um, I think that what we do currently is, first thing we do is we look at the structural connectome in the software and we say, is there anything that's missing? So if, if the corticospinal tract is missing, you know, you can try all you want. It doesn't make any, this TMS doesn't work that way. It's not going to spread across a gap. What the, but it, once you have an idea of what are you dealing with, what's missing and what's not missing, what do you think the mechanism of, and having a clear symptom, we're here to treat this symptom, not everything. Um, then oftentimes you, you, we look at the functional connectome and say, what's out of whack and what's not firing correctly. And we aim at a handful of those guys. Um, now, not everything works always. So sometimes people, you know, particularly people with brainstem injury, they have a completely normal supertentorial functional connectome. We're very normal looking. And so you just say, well, aim at area four if I'm trying to improve motor because it's at least, it's probably where the problem is. So there's a lot of we're learning and this is an area that is absolutely wide open because nobody really has tackled this before what we were doing. What all I can say is I don't have the level of granularity the question asked for, but I will say that like maybe a year ago when I was talk, giving talks on this, I said, well, I can't say that this works, but um, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, when you have antibiotics for pneumonia, like you don't really need to randomize trial when somebody walks in zonked and two days later walks out and they're fine. <laughs> that doesn't really work. Patients don't usually recover from you know plegia to almost normal function in an arm in three days. That's just not the trajectory of recovery I've seen. So while those patients may have got better on their own without PMS, that's a whole different question. Um, if, when you think about it from the idea of getting them into radiation therapy, and you know much much faster because now that you've made them almost normal again, I think it's a pretty simple discussion because the risk is minimal. So it's one of those. Yeah, we don't really question it. We know that it, it seems to be helpful. Yeah, that's great. I think that the, um, as we just wrap up our time, I just want to say it's, you know, I was talking to one of our um, hematologists, oncologists who's involved in immunotherapy um, and uh, ben, ben Vincent and Simon Hagi a little while ago, who's our, who's our neuro-oncologist. And, you know, we were talking as, as there's a oncologic sort of immunotherapy revolution happening simultaneously, the, uh, you know, we, we may not be curing intrinsic brain tumors anytime soon, but, but at some point, maybe we can get to the point where there can be sort of a perpetual stability of them, um, you know, and, and I think that this sort of chronic turning a, a, a deadly disease into a, you know, three, four, five, six, seven year chronic uh, problem, you know, for that period of time makes all of this and all of this uh onco, functional balance and and rehab therapy in particular even more important um i don't know if you have any thoughts on that just to wrap up well obviously you know we know that from the breast cancer literature which is once patients start living a long time whole brain radiotherapy started being a big problem um but i think the bigger way we can think about it is this as much as we think we know about how the brain works, we have a profound knowledge gap and that profound knowledge gap hurts people. And we have to acknowledge that everyone has these hand, I hated this, having hand wavy discussions of why, you know, oh, well, it's swelling or ah, the frontal lobe's mysterious, these, these kind of things. And the truth of it is, you know, once we have the ability to clearly know what we're dealing with, at least have a very good estimate, a lot better we do now. And to actually take action on it. It's a very liberating thing because you feel like you're back to being a, a doctor, like, you know, like when 
you know, hematologists look at your blood count, they're not sitting there making hand wavy discussions. They have a pretty good idea that you have this kind of leukemia and this is what you could do about it. Um, we're, we're, we haven't reached that point with the cerebrum and we need to get there. And we're not, as, you know, we have the tools to, to decompose this, but it's just the most complicated problem in the world. But I think that, yeah, as we start looking at these patients not dying as fast as they used to, but even if they were like, you know, if you're going to spend a 14 months of life with a glioblastoma, you really want to be it where you're a totally different person and everyone hates your guts, or maybe you can potentially not cut across that tiny fiber and still get a pretty good resection that keeps the patient alive for a long time. And these are things that even if you were to cause something intentionally, well, of course, we know that when there's times you have to sacrifice facial nerve for facial schwannoma for whatever reason. Um, that's an intentional decision based on a, a calculated choice. And right now we're causing cognitive deficits when it's not a calculated choice. That, that really shouldn't be the way it is. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shagru. I, I would say that uh, I'm just so honored that you took the time to, to talk to us. You're a true visionary and pioneer in this field um, from a neurosurgical perspective and, and really from a, a, a medical perspective. Uh, you know, uh, I just love how, you know, you're, you're crossing disciplines um, so easily. And and I want to say that to everyone who's in the audience, um, there are a number of questions that I, I wasn't able to ask due to time, but I want you to please reach out to me um, and I can, uh, Dr. Shagru, if it's okay with you, maybe I can put some people in touch with you if they have specific questions after the uh, after this lecture. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to stay on later if people want to stay on this. Question. Yeah. Um, so... Please just everyone uh, who's got additional questions, just email me and uh, I can put you in touch. And then uh, for for now, we I do want to transition to Dr. Hadar's. Uh, he has some announcements for us uh, from the department. Um, so Dr. Shagru, again, thank you so much. Um, and Tony, I want to say thanks to Tony if he's out there for coordinating all this. Uh, uh, Tony Perendi, he's um, uh, works with Dr. Shagru. So. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to stay on if you'd like, but you, you don't, by no means do you have to stay on the, the call. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Dr. Shagru, for a great presentation. Um,